This video is brought to you by Brilliant. One of the key takeaways from the European Parliament elections back in June was the electoral success of Eurosceptic parties. In many ways, this was just the continuation of a long-standing trend. The proportion of seats won by Eurosceptic MEPs has been steadily increasing throughout the 21st century, and that figure might now be as high as 30%, depending on who we count as Eurosceptic. Similarly, it's true that since the 2008 financial crash, the share of votes in national elections going to Eurosceptic parties has risen from around 7% to 27%, and there's been a number of articles, academic publications, and think tank reports written over the past decade about the apparent spread of Euroscepticism. One paper from 2013 even opened dramatically with the words, it was once seen as a British disease, but Euroscepticism has now spread across the continent like a virus. However, it's hard to square this anti-EU doomerism with the latest Eurobarometer survey, where a record 42% of EU citizens say that they now have a positive view of the European Parliament. On top of that, when asked in a survey ahead of the 2024 European elections in June whether they felt that they were a citizen of the EU, 74% of respondents said yes, the highest level ever. So in this video, we'll discuss the phenomenon of Euroscepticism, dig deeper into some current data, and ultimately try and answer whether it's actually on the rise. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. But first, let's start with the concept itself. You may or may not have heard the term before, but essentially the notion of Euroscepticism was developed around 2008 by two academics, Paul Taggart and Alex Sturbiak, who identify two main types, hard Euroscepticism and soft Euroscepticism. Hard Euroscepticism is characterised by an outright opposition to the EU and staunch opposition to European integration, with many hard Eurosceptic parties supporting leaving the EU entirely. The best example of this is, you guessed it, Brexit, with Nigel Farage's UKIP party having campaigned successfully to take the UK out of the EU back in 2016. At the time, Farage said that Brexit would spark a chain reaction, with a possible Nexit, Dexit and even Sexit to follow. Now, whilst that hasn't happened yet, we have seen the Netherlands and Sweden, alongside a number of other EU countries, vote hard Eurosceptic parties into government in recent years, or at least parties that had once supported leaving the EU. However, once they actually get into power, they usually end up moderating their stance, presumably in part because they saw how Brexit went. The 2023 Dutch general election, for example, was won by Hertz Wilders Freedom Party, which had supported a Nexit referendum on EU membership until it came to power, at which point they said that they'd instead focus on dismantling the EU's power from within. Similarly, in the 2022 Swedish general election, the hard Eurosceptic Sweden Democrats finished second. But again, they've now stopped calling for an EU referendum. And party leader Yimi Alkason now says he wants to be, quote, pragmatic and try to change the union from inside. In general, hard Euroscepticism is on the wane in Europe, both because the EU has now been around so long, it's hard to really imagine how you'd actually get rid of it. And Brexit proved that leaving the bloc is no easy task. According to data from the European Social Survey, support for leaving the EU fell in literally every European country between 2016 and 2022, with remarkably sharp drops in Finland, Italy and the Netherlands. Consequently, many hard Eurosceptics have merged into soft Eurosceptics. Soft Euroscepticism is less about actually ditching or dismantling the EU. Rather, soft Eurosceptic parties are opposed to EU enlargement and further centralisation of power in Brussels. The best example of soft Eurosceptic parties are Italy's Northern League Party, which opposes what it calls a European Union superstate and which also wants to abandon the Euro. Then, alongside that, there's the parties that make up the EU's Patriots for Europe group, which is now the third biggest in Parliament, like France's National Rally, Spain's Vox Party, Hungary's Fidesz Party and Portugal's Chega. Now, as we mentioned in the intro, these Eurosceptic parties are on the rise, at both the European and national level. You might assume that these trends would be driven by a widespread antipathy towards Brussels, but the latest data suggests that Europeans are actually becoming increasingly pro-EU, at least in the aggregate. 
European citizens are increasingly optimistic about the future of the EU, have a stronger feeling of being an EU citizen, and are increasingly confident in EU democracy. Looking at data from the EU's post-electoral survey conducted in July 2024, we see the most favourable view ever of the European Parliament, and that the percentage of EU citizens with this positive view is steadily increasing. Moreover, optimism about the future of the EU has also increased. 65% of EU citizens now say that they're optimistic about the future of the EU, up 4 percentage points compared to February to March, which is basically the highest number since the late 2000s. When it comes to democracy, an increasing percentage of EU citizens also say that they're satisfied with how democracy works in the EU, with the February to March figure of 57% being the second highest figure on record. A majority of EU citizens also agree with the statement that my voice counts in the EU, with this figure having jumped by 8 percentage points from 48% in February to March to 56% after the elections in June to July. This is a remarkable surge in just five months, showing the importance of the European elections. And again, if we zoom out to look at the broader trend, we can see this confidence in EU democracy steadily rising over time. What makes this even more interesting, though, is when we compare citizens' trust in the EU to trust in their own national governments, which is actually falling on average. A Eurobarometer report from April to May found that trust in national governments and parliaments has fallen by three percentage points since autumn 2023, having dropped most significantly in the Netherlands by minus nine points, Germany and Ireland both by minus eight points, and Finland by minus seven points. So how do we make sense of this? Well, a total explanation is probably beyond us, but one thing that might partially explain this apparent paradox is the fact that, when soft Eurosceptic parties get voted into power at the European level, pledging to reshape the bloc from within, they might actually increase the EU's legitimacy in the eyes of their voters, merely by participating in the EU's work and its institutional processes. They also drag the EU's policies in their direction. Just look at the EU's rightward drift on immigration and green policies, which might endear the bloc to any more Eurosceptic voters who previously saw the EU as excessively liberal. So to any Europhiles watching, while Euroscepticism might look like it's on the rise, we wouldn't worry too much about the EU. Now, what's something that the TLDR audience have in common? They're willing to learn something new every day. And while our videos are a pretty good start, a lot of stuff we talk about can seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive into analytics and detailed data. Luckily, there's a fun and easy way to learn more, which also doesn't cost thousands of dollars or take years of schooling. That's because Brilliant is the best way to learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving, broken into tiny accessible chunks, designed around your busy schedule. This means that by spending just a few minutes a day, you can accumulate new knowledge over time in an actually fun way, and you'll also feel the satisfaction that comes with bettering yourself and staying ahead. For instance, perhaps you promised yourself that this year you'll learn some programming skills, but there just hasn't been enough time, and the year is now coming to an end. Brilliant's growing number of programming courses are a great way to build foundations and learn real-world applications with courses on Python, essential coding elements like loops and variables, and even developing your mind to think like a programmer. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash TLDR, or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click the link in the description. That way you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support.